Amen. Amen. Good to be together. Hey, thanks for whoever. I always bring a water bottle up here. I never use it, and I always forget it. So shout out to whoever throws those away at the end of the service. Um, all right, a few announcements. I think just one. Uh, Wednesday, so we have our married workshop coming up, okay, that eight-week series, the eight essentials. Uh, for a godly, for a great marriage. That's the only great marriage, the godly marriage. Because um, it was designed by God, so it's good to do it His way. But um, we're having this, this workshop. Wednesday, September 7th, that is going to be our organizational meeting. Okay, so that's the first one, but it's to kind of organize and set everything up for the rest of the series. So if you're inviting a friend... They don't necessarily need to go to that one. It's the 6th. Oh, Tuesday the 6th. I'm sorry. Tuesday the 6th. So, uh, like I said, if you have a friend that you're inviting, they don't necessarily need to come to that one. Okay? Uh, but for all of us here, um, that's a great one to come to. It's going to set everything up. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. Man, it's great to see so many uh, faces back again, and it's great to see some new faces, right? Um Last week, if you weren't here, I preached a sermon called Fishers of Fish. And we're reading from Matthew chapter 4, okay? It's a two-part series uh, on being fishermen. And last week we talked about when Jesus invited the disciples, not, not the time, just invited these guys to follow him, what they were having to leave behind, what he was calling them from. And we ask the question, and we'll ask it again today, how much is a fish worth? Because at the end of the day, he was asking them to leave behind some fish. It's the same thing for us, whether it's a degree, a significant other, a popularity, your image, a career, financial wealth, whatever it is, at the end of the day, it's all fish. And um, there's a great quote that I love. It says, never give your life for something that death can take away. Yeah. Never give your life for something that death can take away. Because at the end of the day, guys, we'd be dumb to pass up an opportunity to follow Jesus for some fish, right? Mm -hmm. And so today is part two. And we're going to be talking about what Jesus was calling them to. Okay, last week we talked about what he's calling them from. What was he calling them to? And so the title of my message is fishers of men. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 18. <laughs> verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men, or I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two uh, other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets and Jesus called them and immediately they left their uh, boat and their father and they followed him. Jesus called them to leave behind their families, their job, their way of doing life. But he didn't say, hey, leave all this behind and come be a part of this miserable, boring life. That's just no fun. No, that's not what he said. You know what else he didn't say? Hey, come follow me and I will see you every Sunday. Come follow me and I'll add you to the membership list. Come follow me so you can be a part of this campus organization and make some friends because you're new to college and you want to be involved somehow. And your parents want you to go to church. Hey, come follow me and I'll show you this really emotional, feel-good experience Maybe we'll go to a Christian rock concert. We can wear crosses around our neck. And it's this really cool religious-y culture. 
hey, just believe that I exist and then just keep doing your own thing. He didn't say that. Jesus wasn't inviting them to just be a part of a religious culture. He was actually trying to get them to leave that. Because at the time, that's what their religion was. It was just a bunch of X's and check marks and rules and just kind of boring traditions and rituals. That's not what he was calling them to. That's part of what he was calling them from. Right. Now, I'll just be honest. I personally, I'm up here preaching. Hey, I would not want to leave everything behind to just go to church. Sorry, that's just, you know what, I'm preaching here, we're at church this morning, but that's not what I'm going to leave my family for. Christianity, without making disciples, is just boring, meaningless tradition. He wasn't calling them to be religious. He said, hey, come be a part of the most meaningful, purposeful, fulfilling, eternal mission that has ever been and will ever be. Come fish for people. There's a book that just came out. It's titled, Why We Co- Cooperate. Uh, there's a doctor. He's a developmental psychologist. He studies uh, development of adolescents, development of children. And he started to, to ponder on the question, what's at the nature of human? What's in the essence of humankind? Many will say selfishness, evil, aggression. But he had a different theory. And what he noticed from his study of development of children is that most kids at a a very early stage, before they learn most wrong behaviors, children have a desire to help. And some of you parents are probably like, not my kid. Uh, But it's really true. It's funny because Kaylee, you know, Kaylee, she's about a year and a half. She's been, you know, she's been throwing these tantrums, and we're trying, you know, she can't talk, and then we don't understand her, so then she gets more frustrated. So we're trying to figure out what it is, and what we figured out kind of this week is she wants to, she wants to help us do what we're doing for her. Uh, You know, hey, we're trying to change her diaper, she's throwing a fit, and then hey, we ask her, hey, could you go get your diaper for us? And she's just so excited, she runs and she gets her diaper and she just lays down. (laughs) (laughs) She wants to help, or you know. What do you want? She wants to carry the grocery in. So we give her this light bag and she carries it up the stairs. She wants to help. And so he started to, to do this study. And then he even noticed that children would hold others to the expectations of the respectful rules that they would learn. So kids on the playground, if some kid walks into the game and isn't following the rules, hey, hey, you're not supposed to do that. So he's talking about how at the very nature, his theory was that people want to help people before we're corrupt by bad behavior. And if you think about it, and he he goes on to talk about this, when you boil our society down, take away the money, take away the fame, take away the greed and the power, you boil everything down, our entire society is built to help people. Education, medicine, engineering, everything, it's all designed to help people in some way or another. Deep down in our core, we desire to help people. And that's what Jesus was providing them the opportunity to do for eternity. He said, hey, you guys like fishing? Come follow me, and I'll help you fish for men. Hey, you want to be an architect? You want to design buildings and structures? Come follow me. I'll show you how to design churches that will help people for eternity. Hey, you want to be a software engineer? I'll help you solve and work with the most intricate system that there ever has been, and you can help human beings. You want to be a doctor or a nurse? Come follow me, and you can help people's health for eternity. You want to be a pharmacist? Come follow me, and I'll show you a medicine that works far greater than anything you got. You want to be in education? Come follow me, and you can teach lessons that will help people for all of time. Guys, there's only one thing we can take to heaven. It's not a degree. It's not money. It's not your girlfriend. It's not popularity. It's not a material possession. It's other people. That's it. 
And so Jesus was providing them, offering them the opportunity to spend their life bringing as many people with them as possible. That's what he was calling them to. And if that doesn't excite you, then you probably never helped someone else become a Christian. I remember when I was a junior in college, we had just been talked to about going into the full-time ministry, about considering this. I wasn't fired up about it at the time, okay? Um, and I remember uh, well, there, was, there was this particular day. I helped baptize two of my friends on the same day. And then on that same day, there were two other of my friends that got baptized as well in Kansas City. It was the most exciting thing ever. And I remember my dad being there, and he and I were talking, you know, if we should try out the ministry or not. And, you know, I was kind of bouncing my thoughts off with him. And he said, you know what, Willie? I think now that you've tasted what it's like to help someone for eternity, it's going to be really hard for you to go do anything else. I think you need to give ministry a shot. And he was right. I had never experienced anything like that before. I had never been a part of something so meaningful and purposeful and eternal and fulfilling than knowing that I helped a handful of people change the course of their life for eternity. And it almost became an addiction. I want to help people. There's nothing else like it. I was playing football. I had a girlfriend. I was about to graduate. I had a great job lined up. I had a lot of friends. None of it. I didn't. doesn't matter. This is what I want to do. That's the opportunity that Jesus was providing. How much is a fish worth? Could you imagine if Peter and John and Paul, some of these guys, would have just said, nah. Think of all the people that they wouldn't have helped. Right? For some of you in here, think of the person who helped you become a Christian. How much is fish worth? Is it worth your soul? Is it worth the soul of hundred other people you might help? Mark 10, verse 29. This, I love this passage. This is an amazing, amazing passage. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age, homes, brothers, sisters, brothers, children, feel on persecutions, and the age to come, eternal life. Hey, we're not leaving behind these fish for nothing. We're leaving them behind for something that's a hundred times better. Picture Jesus coming up and saying, hey, if you give me a thousand dollars, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, Jesus, I don't know. So just, <laughs> this is my, I just... This $1,000, this, I earned, this means a lot to me. This is, this is very special to me, this $1,000. That's what he's offering. You give me that $1,000, I'll give you 100000 Guys, it's a no-brainer. He said, hey, you know what? I'm calling you to leave all this stuff behind, but guess what? I promise you, nobody who leaves behind all these things will fail to receive 100 times more in this life that's how meaningful and worth it it is, and in the next life. Guys, we can't pass this up. We can't. We can't. We've been, offering, we've been offered something incredible. You, you can't pass it up. But, there's a big old but. He didn't just say, hey, leave everything behind and go catch men. What he said was, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. Come follow me. Now, because our society is so saturated in religious culture and emotion, I don't think we always quite get what he means when he says, come follow me. I bet 95% of the people in this room either say they're following Jesus or want to follow Jesus. So today, what I want to talk about next is I want to dig in a little bit deeper. What did Jesus mean when he was calling them to come follow him? 
And so to do this, I want to look at a little bit of the Jewish culture of this time, particularly their education system. They had, you could break their education system down into three parts. Beit Sefer, Beit Talmud, Beit Madrish, all right? The first one, Beit Sefer, house of books, that's what that means. Jewish kids from ages roughly 6 to 10 would, go, would, would start school. They'd go to the local synagogue, and the teacher would begin to teach them to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Some of you guys have kids in the age range of 6 to 10, right? Now picture that, them memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <laughs> That's this first part of school. And they would come into class, and at school they would all have these tablets that they would write on. Okay? And the first day they would pour this honey all over these tablets. And they'd have the kids just lick all the honey off. Honey was a sign of favor of God. And they would read Psalm 119, May the word of God be sweet to your taste, sweeter than honey to your mouth. They wanted to teach these kids that there was nothing sweeter than the Word of God. So after, after this period of school, those who could hang uh, would move on to the next stage. Those who couldn't, at, at any point, if you couldn't kind of keep up, you would usually drop out and go learn your family trade, like fishing. But this next phase, house of learning, it would be about the ages of 10 to 14. They would go on to memorize the rest of the Hebrew scripture, I think, up to Malachi. And this would also, when they would learn the art of asking questions. In their culture, you would, you would answer a question with another question. It's an exciting conversation. <laughs> but this is why in Luke 2... It says after three days they found, they're talking about Jesus as a boy, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his, and his answers. So Jesus was in that phase right there. So after this, the best of the best, it was pretty clear at that point who was and wasn't, would move on. And this was known as the house of study. At the end of this, you would, you would go up to a rabbi that you looked up to and respected deeply. You'd come to them and you would, add, you would present yourself, Rabbi, I want to be your disciple. Please let me into your house of study. So what the rabbi would do, okay, and he, you would spend a, a period of time and he would just ask questions. Question after question after question after question after question. All kinds of questions. Not just about scripture. All kinds of questions. And what he was looking for. He wasn't looking for just some smart person who knew a lot about the religion and could just recite scripture. He was looking for someone who could become a replica of him. Who would learn to think like him. Who could take on his philosophy. Who could take on his way of teaching. His way of walking. His way of talking. His way of dressing. His, way, his everything. That's who he was looking for. Not just anybody. And if he found that person, if he felt like this kid can become me, so that when I die, all my way of doing things will continue on. If they could, he would say, come follow me. At that point, you would leave everything. If you were married, if you had family, everything. You would leave it all behind, and your mission in life at that point was to now become like this teacher. When he ate, you ate, and you ate the way he ate. When he slept, you slept, you slept the way he slept. When he woke, you woke. How he spoke, I'm going to learn to speak like him. I've got to learn to think like him and ask questions like him and treat other people like him and do everything exactly like this teacher. That's an intense lifestyle. And there was a saying, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Because the idea was that you would follow so closely and meticulously behind that the dust from his feet would just cover you. That was the idea. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you covered in the dust of Jesus? Mm -hmm. 
Are you following so closely that you're covered in his dirt? I'm going to follow everything about Jesus, the way he spoke. I'm going to meticulously study in the Bible to see how he spoke to other people. I'm going to see how he spent his time, how he treated people, how he forgave people, everything. I'm going to meticulously follow, and I want to become a replica of him. So when Jesus invited these guys and said, come follow me, they knew exactly what it meant and what they were getting into. They left all these fish behind, not just to be a part of a religious culture, but to become an exact replica to the best of their abilities of this guy. I heard this the other day from a real human being. I believe in Jesus. I love God. I'm a Christian. But there are some things in the Bible that I disagree with and I won't follow. Guess what? You're not a Christian. Let me read these scriptures and let's just listen. This is words from Jesus. John 8, 31 through 32. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. John 14, 23 through 24. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. James 1, 22. James writes, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Amen. Amen. To be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus, it's not about being a part of a religious culture or being a part of a church or a campus ministry or just saying stuff. It's about giving up your life to become like Jesus in every aspect. So I ask us this morning, are we covered in the dust of Jesus? Guys, we're being invited to the most incredible mission we could ever imagine. To fish for men. The most meaningful, purposeful thing ever. And we have the opportunity to be a part of it. But before we do, we've got to be willing to give up everything. Your own opinions, your own ideas your own way of thinking, your own way of living, and imitate Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a follower. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now, it's pretty quiet in here, so I'm assuming there's at least a handful of people that are like, this is impossible. <laughs> now, this is what's cool. In the Jewish culture, you would have to go up to a rabbi and beg him and prove to him why he should choose you to allow you to follow him. Jesus didn't do that. He went to people who already flunked out of school. Yeah. <laughs> they, were fishing. they were fishing. The only reason you learn your family trade is when you can't continue on and you don't want to be a rabbi. He goes up to these fishermen, these dropouts, these flunkies, and he says, hey, guess what? I've got an opportunity for you. I want you to follow me. You don't have to be the best and the brightest and the able to memorize the entire New Testament. Some of you can't even fold your laundry or remember your Bible. So hey, hey, he's not asking you to be the perfect, the best and the brightest. All he's saying is you've got to be willing to set it all aside and just follow me. Just do your best to become like me. You've got to leave everything behind, but that's okay that you are not as good as all these other people. That's okay. I just want you to become like me. That's it. And then he said, take my yoke upon you. Because, hey, my yoke, it's easy, it's light, it's awesome. Amen. That's what he said. You could, all these other rabbis, uh, their way of life was called a yoke. So Jesus saying, take my yoke on. Come follow me. It's, it's, it's better than anything you can imagine. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this morning... That's what's before us. That's the opportunity that we all have been given. That's the invitation we've all been given. Hey, every one of you, come fish for men. Amen. Come be a part of the greatest mission you could ever imagine. But 
You just got to leave all that fish behind and you've got to become like me. And if you do, you will not fail to receive a hundred times more. It's the most fulfilling, amazing thing you could ever imagine. And so the question for us this morning that we'll close out with, how much is a fish worth? How much is a fish worth? We're going to pray, and then we'll close out with one last song this morning. Father, we come before you this morning. Um, man, just grateful, God. We're, we're a bunch of mess in here, and uh, you've still given us the opportunity to follow you. God, you've given us the opportunity to be a part of the greatest mission uh, on the face of this earth. God, to be a part of something that's going to last for eternity. To be a part of helping people in a way that no other job or career could ever do. God, it's so exciting. Um, but God, before we do that, we've got to become like you. We've got to learn from you. You've got to, we, we need to be taught by you um, and discipled by you to know how to most effectively help people. And so I pray this morning for everybody in here, God, that we could all examine ourselves uh, and really think about things that are holding us back, that we could give up anything that we're holding on to. And God, whether that's our pride or our own way of doing things, or maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a career or something that's taking up our time, whatever it is, God, I pray that we can put it all aside, that we can drop it all, get out of the boat and follow you, that we would become replicas of you, that when people would see the people in this room, they would just see 150 replicas of Jesus Christ. And that through us, we could help so many people for eternity. God, we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll close out with one last song.